Hello, I'm Joe Kelly. I'm a marine geologist uh, at the University of Maine. I study the geology of the seafloor and coastlines. And we're here to look at how those kind of come together um, in Acadia National Park, this is Thompson Island, understanding how water uh, changes where it is on the earth over time. I mean, this shoreline is often called timeless, but it, it's really just constantly changing. We'll see some evidence uh, later when we look around here for uh, the, the fact that the ocean was hundreds of feet over our head just a few 10,000 years ago and, and hundreds of feet below us uh, within that same interval. Here today we're going to be considering what's happening right now. Sea level is rising and this particular place is nothing unusual. You can see what we'll be looking at here almost any place along the coast of Maine. There's evidence that the ocean is rising. We can look around and see things that would not look this way if the, if the ocean were at the same elevation all of the time. Here you can see the way it's eroding along the edge here. There's tree stumps where trees have, mature trees have come into contact with the ocean and, and died and been cut off by the park service or fallen into the water. I mean, these are mature trees. They weren't. They couldn't be born in this environment. They were born when the shoreline was was out there, but the shoreline has come to meet them because the ocean has risen. And the accoutrements of our society are, are around us too. These are the remnants of fire pits. They're all over this area. The Park Service put them in, and the ocean has come and, and removed them. To protect them, you can see these granite blocks that were emplaced. Nobody remembers now, maybe 50 years ago, to kind of hold the, the, the shoreline in place. They've been ineffective. Uh, the, the ocean has come around it, and you can even sort of get a sense for the, how much the shoreline has changed here um, but by considering that these rocks were probably put right at the edge of what was the upland at that time. We're at a, another common coastal setting uh, along the main coast. This is Thompson Island, but behind me you can see this grassy area here. It's a special kind of grass. Uh, this is a salt marsh. And this particular uh, grass here is called salt hay because the, uh, in the olden days the colonists used to graze their, their cows on it. But what's important to us here is that this grass lives within a vertical range of about oh, five or six inches. It, it can't go above it because it will be outcompeted by the upland plants, it can't go below it because the ocean will drown it. And so it's narrowly confined between mean high water, the average height of high tide, and the highest high water that will happen uh, on a full moon or a new moon when the tides are unusually high. Uh, so it's, it's, it's trapped, it can't move. What's astounding is that if we were, this is a park, we can't pour here, but if we could drill down here, we would come up with meters and meters of peat from this plant always living in the same envelope of, of, of the tidal range between mean high water and mean highest high water. But we can go down meters below this, 10 feet, and it'll be the same plant. So it tracks the fact that the ocean level has risen because this plant can only live in that narrow restricted range. We have means to radiocarbon date this plant from the bottom. I can know when that was mean high water and, and, and subsequently track it coming up through cores and we've done that all along the main coast uh, and been able to measure how sea level has risen along the coast over the last few thousand years. So there's been a huge addition of water to the ocean and it's gotten warmer and which means it's expanded and takes up room but so much so that, that the shoreline is just literally being driven landward uh, by this, this, this rise in the ocean. Over here is the Bar Harbor Tide Gauge. Tide gauges are devices that are installed by the federal government to measure and predict the tides. And they, are, they exist in all U.S. cities. This one was built in 1947. Portland was in 1912, and others go into the 1800s. And they're very good at that. They, they help us predict tides. But by the 1940s, when this was put in, people began looking at uh, the records and they, and they observed that the tides just didn't go up and down. They went up more than they went down and as a consequence, they came to the conclusion that contemporary sea level is rising. Here, it has risen at 2.3 millimeters per year. Seems small, but it's every year. In my lifetime, the water level here has risen 6.3 inches. 
that's a fair amount. That's the base level. On a storm, of course, it's much higher. And that's happening all over the place. Uh, the water is just slowly but surely coming up. And we're finding areas, particularly man-made land, like this, this is a, a parking lot here, the Portland waterfront, will be underwater more and more as, as the ocean simply comes up. These structures were built at a, at a different time to a different level of the ocean, and now they're succumbing to the fact that the ocean is rising. Behind me is uh, a sea cave. It's called the Nemini Cave, and it's, it's built into this, this cliff here of granite and some other rocks. Uh, but what's important to us about that is that it's where caves along the ocean have to be. It's pretty much at the high water mark, the average level of high tide. You can't form a cave above high tide in this kind of rock uh, because the waves don't get there often enough, and you can't form it below it because there's no way to excavate. So a cave like this marks the average level of high tide until it collapses, but then a new cave will form. We'll see that there are other caves on this island and in other places that are well above the present level of the ocean, suggesting to us that the ocean, in fact, at one point in the past was much higher than today. If we were standing here 15,000 years ago, there would be glaciers receding in the distance but they would be what are called tide water. They'd float up and down with the tides, and this area that we're standing on right here, just above present sea level, would have been about 150 feet deep. Behind me, down below there, is Monument Cove. Now, it's a beautiful cove. It's boulder beach. You can see the big rounded boulders of granite and, and the cliffs. Common enough scene on the main coast. This is a rather spectacular example, but there are beaches like this, there are cliffs like this, and there's a feature like this thing I'll talk about in a moment. But to point out the boulders, people think of a beach as always being sand. Uh, a beach is a deposit formed by waves. Here there's no sand available, and so the waves have made a beach out of big, round uh, granite boulders. The, the rock erodes a bit, those blocks come off, they're angular, and truly, in a, in a winter of storms, they're rounded into almost spheres. Boulder Beach, always at high tide. Uh, you're not going to find one down below, necessarily. But then, against the sea cliff in the backdrop, you can see uh, a standing column of granite, and it is attached to, it is bedrock. It's attached to the granite at the bottom. It's not something that moved there, and it's an erosional feature. Once it was a cave, there used to be a, an arch over it. It was an arch, a sea arch once, it was a cave. But it's evolved down to now that's all gone, and we have the freestanding sea stack. And again, these is, exist pretty much at mean high water. Um, if you find them higher than that, well, then the water had to be higher than that because these don't form overnight. This takes some time to form. But here we see a beautiful example of it. Today is a really beautiful, calm summer day. These are not the conditions under which this beach formed or is even maintained. In the winter, it is very different. We couldn't come down here. The waves could even be crashing up this high. Spray certainly would be. And that's when the, the waves can come in and quarry these large granite blocks. You might think, well, can, can a wave move those? A wave can move those easily. There's rocks all around me here that have been thrown up from below by storm waves. So winter is the time. Not easy to get to in the winter, quite dangerous. I wouldn't be here in a big, big winter storm. But that's when those boulders are active. And now that they've been freed up and are loose, literally waves will pick them up and smash them against that cliff in the background, continuing to erode it in. And that process will just continue. Next, we're going to go to a spot about 220 feet above this, and we're going to look for some similar features to what we've seen. Caves, cliffs, uh, boulder beaches, and sea stacks, but not at sea level anymore. We're going to go to where the ocean once was, 200 or so feet above this elevation. This is a cave. You can see well into it, and there's a rounded boulder in the very back of it. But we're not at sea level today. This is a paleo sea cave, because uh, the only way you can form a cave like this is for waves to break against this. And if it were glaciers, you'd expect angular, broken up rock fragments. But when you, when you look in there, you can, you can see a spherical rock. Probably the last big storm 
the ice was still melting away back on the mainland and the sea level was high because the ice weighed so much it pushed the Earth's crust down and waves were rolling in here. We're about 220 feet above contemporary sea level. But it's the same kind of features we, we could see down below, the sea cliff, the sea cave. If you could be here as, well, of course you'd be underwater. I mean, be, the water would be right there, but there would have been no, no trees, obviously. It would have been the ocean. But then as the glaciers melted away, the land lifted up higher and higher to its normal elevation where it is today, and the ocean fell, there still would have been no trees. It would have been, it was a very cold climate then, tundra. It would take, I'm guessing, a thousand or two thousand years for plants to be able to come in here, colonize this, and eventually some trees would start to grow. But certainly the indigenous people who lived in this area knew of this, a nice place to go on a hot, hot day to, uh, to camp maybe. It's, it's not, it's granite above and below, so you're not gonna, there's no archeology span site here. You can't dig down and find anything but I'm sure this has been used by many people for a very long period of time. I'm here on Day Mountain in Acadia National Park. It's a forest today, but it wasn't always. Um, I'm staring off here to the northeast, the direction from which our winter storm waves come, and at the end of the last ice age, uh, the Earth's crust was lowered here, and uh, the ocean came in, and this was the shoreline. Behind me was a sea cliff, uh, and specifically behind me right there is a, a paleo or an ancient sea stack, much like the one we, we, we observed down in Monument Cove. Now this would have been active for probably no more than 500 years, 15,000 years ago, but waves would have struck here. Nobody probably lived here then, in fact, certainly nobody did. And again, as the water went back down, this would have become a tundra probably. But for a brief period of time, 220 feet above modern sea level, this was the shoreline. And if you really want to come here, uh, this is Day Mountain. We came off the carriage path and you can walk along the length of it. We're not going to go there, but there's a boulder beach about a half a mile along that's really spectacular. I've seen a lot of changes in water volume in the ocean as the ice melted, the ocean rose, the ice pushed the land's crust down and the ocean came in. I'll thank you for watching. You can see this and, and other things like it at the Climate Change Institute website uh, at the University of Maine.